Estevez walked into the lake house, sitting high above the surface of Cauldron Lake. Cement walls reverberated the echoes of her footsteps like ripples in water. The fog that once hung itself from the branches of wet trees now draped over the building like a veil of the macabre. Somewhere, a spiral sat spinning. Something was off about this place. The floor was empty, deserted. It was as if everyone had suddenly vanished. She shouted out her arrival in case anyone was nearby, in case anyone could hear. There was no reply, only the quiet wailing of a lonely void. This didn't make sense. This was an FBC facility. There were protocols for things like this. Still, a report of an alter world event had come from this area, and it was her job to respond. If she wanted answers, she'd have to go deeper. For years, Remedy Entertainment has been obsessed with exploring a unique subgenre of horror and sci-fi known as the new weird. Before Control even had a name, back when it was internally known as Project 7, creative director Sam Lake had been citing prominent new weird authors like Jeff Vandermeer as bold inspiration for where Remedy wanted to take their universe next. To push their games' aesthetics toward bold new strange heights, rarely even approached in the games industry. The kind of swings you only really see in novels, film, and TV. Half a decade later, Alan Wake 2's latest DLC, The Lake House, pushes us further into Remedy's spiral of the new weird, with new disturbing horrors that are really, well, as Sam Lake puts it, out there. But what is the new weird? That question is sort of hard to answer especially in games like Alan Wake 2. After all, Remedy has built a particular brand around quirky, campy strangeness that it's sort of hard to pin on just one thing, especially within such an opaque genre. Maybe it's the monsters that wiggle out from splatters of paint. Maybe it's the canvases that scream in agonizing riddles. Maybe it's the buildings that twist themselves into dark corridors of unreal connections. Maybe it's the rows of typewriters used to critique an industry unflinching in its pursuit of diluting art through the use of generative AI. Maybe it's the way all these horrors unsettle us beyond what we can even describe. Hmm. Right now, what we know for sure is that there's something weird about Alan Wake 2's DLC and its stance on AI. And if we want to know more about it, We'll have to surrender ourselves to the spinning realities of Remedy's cosmic horrors and our own real-world technological anxieties. This is Save Room. This is... At the intersection of horror, sci-fi, and fantasy lives the rebellious literary genre known as the New Weird. It's the latest iteration in a subgenre dating as far back as the 19th century, with prominent writers like Edgar Allan Poe and H.P. Lovecraft exploring the horrors that lie beyond the faculties of our mind and into the realm of the gothic, the cosmic, and the supernatural. Since then, depictions of the weird have only made the genre equally as vague as they have provocative, making clear definitions of it more difficult than you think. So let's paint a picture to help us understand. Perhaps the best illustration of the new weird in Remedy's games are with their use of setting. This time around, it's FBC agent Estevez taking on the lake house that serves as the backdrop for Remedy's new atmospheric and twisted terrors invoking that feeling of discomposition, that feeling that something is off, within seconds of establishing mood and scene setting, par the course for any new weird horror or gothic text, of entering a zone of unreality meant to disturb a character's status quo. Think examples like Dale Cooper driving into the town of Twin Peaks, Detective Rust entering Carcosa in the first season of True Detective. The stalkers going into the zone in Tarkovsky's Stalker. The narrator riding up toward the mansion in Edgar Allan Poe's The Fall of the House of Usher. Or the scientists walking up toward Area X in Annihilation. 
Within seconds, everything these protagonists thought they knew of reality will become contorted into new perspectives they can never return from. It's a step into a weird new world they can never look back from. A gaze into the shivering void. So what is the new weird here exactly? Is it just entering a strange setting? Not quite. Beyond the broad mix of genres, the new weird is about exposing ourselves to the cosmic forces within a setting that, in turn, deconstruct our notions of reality. Whether that stems from a literal form of the metaphoric alien, or something more subtle and symbolic. Occasionally, even both. It's a terrifying subjection to the unreal, the unbelievable, and an exposure to the shivering void. In a distillation of Mark Fisher's definitions of the weird, Elvia Wilk says that the weird is an element or zone or experience that is not completely explainable according to our current structures for categorizing the world. And yet, it exists. We can come in contact with it, experience it, and try to describe it, knowing description will fall short. In other words, the new weird isn't just about the objects of horror faced within a text, but the setting itself that disrupts reality, and the subsequent failures when attempting to make sense of that spectacular unknown. Of course, this isn't anything necessarily new for Remedy. They've been refining this technique of a protagonist entering an area of alienation and coming out changed since the first Alan Wake game all the way back in 2010. Since then, unreality rug pulls have been a staple in the Remedy shared universe. Jesse walking into the oldest house, infected by the hiss. Saga Anderson entering the overlap of Cauldron Lake in search of Alan Wake. Sheriff Breaker slash Sean Ashmore entering the worlds of multiversal television in Night Springs as Time Breakers all a thrust into the new weird. And every one of these characters, each end their chapters, forever changed. The Lake House is no different, with Remedy using subtle techniques from their staple mise-en-scene to estrange us within the opening seconds of starting the DLC. Cameras pan upside down. Hellish reds poke through the webs of foliage and dew. Wind gives way to the score of insidious drones. Verdant landscapes bleed their pine grove colors to every corner of the screen, refracting off an impossible fog to create a world engulfed in unusual green. An exaggerated color grade of the scenery of a miserable Pacific Northwest. All of this before even stepping foot inside the lake house. Makes sense. We're entering a place we do not belong in, after all. But the new weird isn't just about setting and design. It's not just about terrifying creatures or tone. There is, after all, a point to be made within the genre. So, what is the lake house trying to say with its horror? In short, every element of the new weird in the lake house, every enemy, every memo, Every addition of the DLC's narrative lore, every impossibly sublime scene of paint and typewriting, are all a means to criticize a growing misuse of AI and the creation of digital art. A mode of creation Remedy doesn't just disagree with, but detests. Thus, the objects of horror we find throughout the lake house, taken together, become emblematic of how generative AI is ultimately doomed to fail. Or worse, kill us in the process. Inside the lake house, the new weird takes its full hold, plunging us straight into the horrors of the artifice and unreality. Rooms sit abandoned. CRT televisions hum with an ominous buzz, alerting of some kind of experiment in progress. Elevators go down to floors that lead to nowhere, or drop you off in rooms that twist themselves into altered locations. 
where bare concrete walls become covered in splatters of oily paint, and where the entrance you've come in from is no longer in the same place. The only way back in a place like this is through. All of this, of course, serves the disorient, to hone in on an atmosphere meant to unnerve, groundwork for a narrative even stranger than the place we're in. In classic Remedy fashion, much of the game's narrative texture is told via in-game documents, memos and emails scattered throughout the facility pointing toward two parallel projects of artificial content creation, each headed by one of the Marmonts that have slowly and angrily unraveled to the crisis they're now in today. It works. It's theater of the mind. Horror silhouetted by text turned imagination. An extra punch of the new weird meant to heighten feelings of tension and uncertainty. But it's the things inside the lake house that are the weirdest of them all. Beyond the kidnap writer who has convinced himself he's in an immersive writing retreat. Beyond the band that has awakened their para-utilitarian powers through their own music are the emaciated figures that peel themselves off the hanging canvases around the facility, literally generating themselves off walls of formless abstraction, linkily walking toward Estevez with invulnerability. It's a weird sight to behold. We've never seen enemies like this, let alone ones that can't be killed, and much less ones that emerge from something as mundane as a wall of paint. Yet still, we have to face them all the same, fighting a windless war against the artificial alien. In a Digital Trends interview with Kyle Rowley, the game director of The Lake House, Rowley says that the creatures were inspired by Alex Garland's adaptation of Annihilation, at least visually. He says, We were trying to make things scary, but not just revert to the default of dark and black. How can we use color in a slightly more interesting landscape? So, we're looking at pop culture and how different movies and TV shows have used their visual language to get across specific emotions. This is in reference to the creatures as colors, refracting the oily silvers, sage, and lavender that make up the canvases the enemies are born from. One look at the design of the doppelganger from the film version of Annihilation, and you'll see exactly what Rowley is talking about with the enemies in the lake house. Ironically though, the inspirations from Annihilation actually run much deeper in the lake house, beyond just visual language, especially in the context of the new weird. You see, Jeff Vandermeer, the same Jeff Vandermeer Sam Lake had been citing all those years ago, is not just the author of Annihilation and the Southern Reach trilogy, but is actually one of the major critics and prominent figures of the new weird. Together with his wife Anne, the Vandermeers wrote a book titled The New Weird, an anthology of essays and critical writing serving as a guide by giving structure to text and ongoing debates about the genre. In this regard, Remedy has come full circle, or rather, full spiral with The New Weird in their games. In the introduction to the anthology, Jeff and Anne give what is perhaps one of the single most important aspects of the genre, stating that new weird fictions are acutely aware of the modern world, even if in disguise, but not always overtly political. As part of this awareness of the modern world, new weird relies for its visionary power on a surrender to the weird, often involving the use of postmodern techniques that do not undermine the surface reality of the text. In other words, through some kind of rhetorical device, new weird texts have something to say about our outside world. And in the case of the lake house, the new weird Estevez encounters is entirely about the world of art and how we're killing ourselves in an attempt to bastardize it. Deep below the lake house, underneath the waters of Cauldron Lake, lives Project Arbutus. Diana Marmont's attempt at controlling para-utilitarian powers by copying and replicating the writing of Alan Wake. It's a not-so-subtle slight against AI, with countless rows of typewriters barely able to duplicate the style of Wake's writing. 
none of what Diana produces is ever sufficient. Always needing more of Wake's scripts to source more accurate writing. And when she eventually can't get her hands on any more pages of Wake's manuscript, she turned toward Ed Booker, forced to copy the style of Wake's writing over and over and over again, believing it to be a kind of writing exercise all the while. Of course, this wasn't good enough for Diana either. Not accurate enough. All of it in reality, just aimless replication without any soul. An attempt at mass production, churning out nonsensical sludge ad infinitum. Continuously ignoring the warning signs straight from the source. Obviously, I can't help but think about our own anxieties with generative AI, where the hard work and soul from creatives is ripped off without so much as a citation, all in the pursuit of profits. All while, at the same time, exacerbating our global climate crisis by eating up countless gallons of water while we enter mindless prompts into chat GPT. All while the earth, trees, forests, plants, soil, absorbed little to no carbon in the year before massive hurricanes, extreme flooding, and record heat. All of these real-world terrors forefronted by the horrors of the lake house's new weird. On the other end of the lake house's generative anxieties is Project Ramnus, Jules Marmont's attempt at parutility through his own means of mass production. In this case, forcing Rudolf Lane to paint pictures powerful enough to open a threshold. Of course, this doesn't go well either, with Lane peeling himself of his corporeal form by painting dozens of abstracts and, eventually, a powerful self-portrait. In essence, becoming the painting itself. It's agonizing for Lane. Even after ridding himself of his flesh, the post-traumatic stress of Jules' mistreatment makes Lane echo out shouts of misery. After countless attempts at generating art by forced mass production, it's this that's the result. Himself, a self-portrait, make them see. It's frightful to listen to, but even more dreadful to put it all into context. In the wake of mass production is an existence consisting only of agony. Of course, I can't go over every single instance of what we might consider new weird within the lake house. That kind of close read is probably beyond the scope of the video. Still, it's to Remedy's credit as storytellers that they always leave you with that feeling that there's always something more at play. That there's something there to provoke curiosity. Another layer of the new weird left to turn over in your mind. What I can say for certain, however, is that Remedy's use of the new weird to explore horror in the DLC achieves the genre's goal of a disconsolate end. That feeling that even though you've reached the end, there's no real satisfactory resolution. After all, save for Ed Booker, everyone inside the facility, including victims like Rudolph Lane, all met untimely ends. And yet, it's not even that level of false closure that ultimately lingers. No, it's the horrors out there, the ones out in the real world, that frighten us the most, where rampant uses of AI and generative mass production have only just begun. In this regard, who knows who the next victims will be? This is the real horror of the lake house, a DLC leveraging new weird aesthetics to make us gaze into that void hanging over every single piece of art out in the real world. And how the corporations that dictate what constitutes as art, let alone what gets to be made, are refusing to see the production of it as anything less than shallow content. And how, no matter how good, how creative, how deep, how powerful and resonant something may be, there will still be the people out there who refuse to fully engage with any sort of art, no matter the medium, who will then in turn attempt to also steal it and twist it into something less than, something unrecognizable. It's only but a matter of time. Beyond the unnerving atmosphere, beyond terrifying creatures, 
Beyond rhetorical framing and droning scores and shifting environments, beyond all of that is always something deeper, something that really disrupts. This is the new weird. This is what the lake house aims to evoke. What Remedy has been successfully obsessed with illustrating time and time again. Except this time, it's forefronted more than ever. This time, it's not just a loop. And it's not a spiral either. It's a mirror. A reflection of our shivering void. A glimpse into the new weird. Let me know what you think of the Lake House DLC. What do you think is new weird about it? And are you excited for how they'll illustrate it again when it comes time for Control 2? I know I am. I'll be waiting for you down in the comments. Until next time, my name is Christian. This is Save Room, and we'll see you in the next one.